What if Jesus came to reveal himself in us so that we could be a part of that revelation in others' lives? He said things like that. Uh, Paul mentioned things like uh, you being uh, a letter, a sweet-smelling aroma, uh, to those around you. I desperately need to understand, as we say it again this week, the truth of what really happened when the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, took on, became flesh, became 100% man. So as I was uh, praying and studying this week, uh, I've really drawn drawn over to uh, 1 John. Of course, 1 John is a you can't help but miss that John wrote the Gospel of John and 1 John. Uh, 1 John. Here, when we turn there for a minute this morning, first I'm going to read again John 1.14. Uh, the Word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, Wednesday night we, we got into some interesting conversation down at South Campus in the Bible study. We, we got to thinking about this idea of, of Jesus being more than more than just a sacrifice. There's some, there's some really bad, crazy, warped theology that's in our churches. That just doesn't really line up with what Scripture says. And it doesn't matter what denomination. I mean, everybody's got their own little quirks and quips and, and things. Uh, the one we, I think the one that sprung up Wednesday, one of the ones that made me think about this was that, well, you know, Jesus, uh, yeah, he's God, he's man, okay. Uh, but, you know, he came to earth and he, and he knew that he was going to go to the cross and he, and he knew that he was going to die. But, but since he knew that and he knew he was going to be raised from the dead, it, it wasn't really a, a big deal for him. It wasn't a real big deal. As if to say, if you really knew that you were going to be resurrected one day, you were really going to have a physical resurrection and that you would uh, live your life differently. That you'd be okay with it. Uh, so here's this, and this thought comes from this idea that, well, you know, Jesus is the sacrifice. But when you think about his coming in the flesh, and he him becoming man and him emptying himself of all but love, setting aside his godlike qualities, living in the nature. God is love, living in the power and authority and the filling of the Holy Spirit, showing us what Genesis 1 and 2 was all about, God's original plan. That Jesus was more than just a, a sacrifice for your sin, that he, we said it, we say it's Wednesday, that he literally became, he who knew no sin became sin. So it wasn't like I just paid the penalty, but if you realize that Jesus, think of, think of the most heinous thing you've ever done. Okay. And Jesus became that on the cross. He became that. He died and he took that with him. He took that sin and took it to death with him. So that it so that the chains 
And the, the power of that sin could be broken by death and raised again. Does that make sense? Does that help you with understanding this coming in the flesh? Because he, he doesn't come as like a, a superhero. And the church tries to... Dr- Shame on us, man. We, we do this stuff, we, we take this stuff from the world, and we stick it into the church, hoping that the world will get the truth of the Scripture. And what they're getting out of it is, oh, well, Jesus was just Superman. Yeah, it's okay to say that if you really believe that he was a man in the first place. Because when you look at Superman, he's really not man. Because he he lives on his super qualities. Jesus didn't take on. Jesus didn't live with his godlike qualities. He lives like you and, and me are to live. And anything he does, he does because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. So to understand his coming in the flesh. And fulfilling what we should fulfill in our lives. Because of the sin in my life, I should receive that scourging. I should receive that painful death on the cross. I should die and go to hell because of my sin. But he came and took my place. He came in and and moved me and took my place. He pushed me out of the way and, and was hit by the train. He smacked the bottle out of your hand and, and took it himself. I mean, that's the picture if he's all man. See, he feels like you feel. And he hurts like you hurt. And because his coming in the flesh and his resurrection and his sending of the Holy Spirit, he says, now you're never alone. That if you begin to feel that pain again, you don't have to feel it yourself. Not only is he there with you, but he's already died and took you he's already died and paid the price for it. But yet we live like there's something else he's got to do. So in first John when John writes First John, I mean, he he helps us. He he's trying to explain this. Look what he says in First John. Let me just start reading a little bit. The first letter of John. Tell me if he's not trying to explain what John one fourteen is saying. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which are which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. I mean if you have a halfway decent study Bible, you'll see the reference right there. John 1 1, 1 4, 1 14. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What is he telling you? That this Word, the second person of the Trinity that became flesh, we have literally, we saw Him. We touched Him. 
We cried with Him. We ate with Him. It was clearly manifest. We, we clearly saw this truth. Verse 3, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, of course, when you see the word fellowship, you can't help but say, intimacy. I mean, oneness, relationship. So, what's John telling us here? That, that at that time, we saw Jesus. We handled Him. I mean, we stuck our hand in his side, man. We broke bread with him. We fished with him. We became one with him. And then he says, those of you who have not had that same privilege, if you will, can still have that same privilege. Because having right relationship with us brings you to Him. That should help us in the church, especially in the area of evangelism. I mean, we sit around and cry and want and desire. We want the church to grow. We want the church to grow. We want to see the church grow. How did John grow the church? When he went out there, he unveiled Jesus to those around him. Come on. Really? Are you, are you still trying to figure out the, the next quick scheme to get him in the door? The next greatest, since slightest, uh, sliced bread, church growth plan to get him in the door. What could it be now? How did they get him in the door? They went into their doors, didn't they? When they went into the house, when they went into the highways, when they went into the byways, when they went down to the marketplace, when they went down to school, they realized that this Jesus, who was revealed and unveiled himself to them, now living inside of them, is going to be the one that they get to reveal. That's their message. That's the hope. That's the truth. That's the gospel. You have nothing else to tell anybody except this. Because everything you try to tell them, if it doesn't begin with this, they're going to miss this. Verse 4, And these things we write to you that your what? Joy, somebody mentioned that this morning, joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you. You listen to all the messages that you've been hearing or that you've heard. According to John, the message that they preach is the message they got from Jesus. He declared it to us, so we declare it to you. But we, right now, we've got more battles. We've got more theological battles going on. We've got more books written on certain particular topics and instances and wonderments of Scripture. And I'm wondering if it ever really gets back to Him. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. So not only is God love, 
God is light. Yes. If God is light, that means he's not what? Darkness. Darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him, and we walk in darkness, we what? Uh, now, does everybody understand what it means to walk in darkness? Yeah. Darkness would be that uh, I got my chain, my ball and chain out, remember? And I, if I get that out and I, and I start doing this number again, that's walking in darkness. I say I know Jesus, but my life, my way of life, my actions, my mindset, my words are not the fruit of the Spirit. Walking in darkness and the fruit of the Spirit are opposite. Yeah. Paul talks about being slaves to sin. That's darkness. Uh, he mentions it in Galatians. The opposite of the fruit of the Spirit is? Yeah, fruits of the flesh. The flesh, flesh lusts against the Spirit. There's this contrast. Light and dark. If we say we have fellowship, this is verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Truth, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If you want to battle about something, the, 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 the scripture is more clear about a sinless perfection than a continuing sin perfection, or a con continuing in sin. I mean, if you really want to battle theologically about something, why battle for something less than? If you're going to battle for something, battle for something that's greater than. Does that make sense? It says here, he cleanses us from all sin. Amen. The blood of Jesus. Yes. We have fellowship with one another. Why do you think he says stuff like this? Um, uh, no greater love does one have for another than he would lay, a brother lay down his life for another. Right? That kind of thing. What about... Uh, Truly you're my disciples indeed if you love one another. Doesn't this scream in that right here? We have fellowship with one another. Walking in darkness would be you being in the church for 150 years and continuing to carry aught for one of your brothers or your sisters year after year after year. And if you really think that you could take that ought with you to heaven, I think you're missing the point. Because there is no ought in heaven, there's certainly ought in hell, though. Wow. And what if you understood that the way that Jesus lived his life on earth is the way he entered eternity? The way he was resurrected. He had a physical resurrection, Paul says. And when he came back and hung out for those 40 to 40 to 50 days, he was hungry. Whoa. So a physical, physical resurrection, and he's still man. Wow. And what if the kind of resurrection, well, doesn't Paul say we're partakers? Peter says we're partakers of the divine nature which is God's love. Amen. Paul says we have the same kind of fellowship, the uh, same kind of resurrection, physical resurrection, as Jesus. So are you okay with how you're living right now? Are you okay with your mindset? Are you okay with your, your words? Are you okay with your actions? Are you okay that, hey, if this was the last breath I take, I'm cool, man, everything's cool. Because the way you are now is the way you're going to enter the eternals. And there is an eternal heaven and there is an eternal hell. That's right. So are you okay with that? Because that's what John's getting at here. That your joy may be full. Not three quarters. Not I'm going to run on a half tank. That's okay. I can still get another 150 miles. 
It's that your joy is full. If you walk in the light as He is in the light, you have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Some of us look at that and say, well, what does that mean? I'm, I'm confused. Either we have sin or we don't have sin. Well, you've got to go back to Romans 3.23 for one place. And it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus for you. I thought it was the one I was thinking of. What's Romans 6? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So he's not talking about this sin again, don't sin again, in the sin, out of sin. He's just making these statements. So if you haven't entered in this relationship with Jesus, and you haven't been washed with the blood of the Lamb, and yet you say, I have no sin, then you're a liar. We deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. And then, of course, 1 John 1, 9 is also another memory verse of Bible school. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that just kicks the, in the teeth the whole greasy grace or the uh, cheap grace thing where God just loves us and everybody gets to go no matter what, no matter how you're living. Because it says there, chapter, verse 9, there's this big word. It's a huge word. And it's two letters long. And it's called the conditional conjunction. And the word is if, which says you have a response that God has unveiled and revealed himself to you. And what are you going to do? How are you going to respond to that? Do you embrace, run to, abide, remain in him? Or do you shake your fist in his face? And of course we go back to Acts to see a perfect picture of that. Acts 2.37, Acts 7.42. Where you have Peter preaching on one hand, and they embrace and say, Hey, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? Peter says, Confess, brother, confess. Stephen's preaching to the church, and they what? Gnash their teeth, they're stiff necked, hard hearted, plugged ear. They've been in the church their whole life. Don't change my theology. I know what's going on. No, you're not, because the verse before says the truth's not in you. You're a liar. If we confess. So that's a response. And Paul will go as far as that. I live my life. I die daily. I live my life in this mode, in this mindset of open confession. Of offering myself a living sacrifice. Yes. Not that I sin in word, thought, and deed daily and keep going in. Keep hitting the altar. But that I live here. Because if I don't live here, guess where I'm living? Back in the flesh. Because here he says, I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. Christ now lives in me. And the life I now, this is Galatians 2.20, and the life I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So if you're really looking for something to do in your Christian walk in ministry, go give yourself to somebody. In Jesus' name. Woo! Because that's what He did for you. I mean, if you really want to show the plan and you really want to proclaim the gospel and you want to tell the good news to somebody, then give yourself to them. Wow. Just like this. Um, I'm going to skip over now. I'm going to go over to the end of the book now. It's like there's a real cool book end here. You got chapter one, then go over to chapter five. We don't have to get time to get into the whole love sandwich thing. But we'll talk about that later. If you haven't heard it, First John chapter five. Now look how he ends this letter.
Look what he says in, in chapter 5. Ready? Verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, born of God, and everyone who loves him, who begot... Oh, let me start. I'm sorry. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. He, he's, again, what's he reiterating? John 1.14. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ born of God, it's you got it. He came in the flesh. He's born of God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of help me. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Have you been born of God? Then you're an overcomer of this world. That there's nothing on this earth that can overtake you. No sin, no person, no demon, no demonic thing. No, what do you call them things that we're going to fight in a few years? The battle of the... You just said it. What do you call them? Goblins. Zombies. Zombie? No zombie. I mean well, nothing. There's nothing that's going to... If you're an overcomer. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. And how does that even be able to take place? How can John even say that? Well, it's because of this. See, if Jesus doesn't come in the flesh, he can't say that. And if he can't see it, you can't partake in it. That's huge. Absolutely huge. And this is in the four again. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So if we struggle and we whine and we moan and we grit our teeth and we and we give up and we use the famous last words, I don't give a rip and all that, then what we're saying is we really don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because it always goes back to your faith, which shows itself in your life. That's why we say this cross-style thing, it's a way of life. Verse 6, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Uh, you want to go over how baby's born? You can do that Tuesday night. Well, not, only but, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. And look what he says in verse 7. Now, who is the one that doesn't quite get the Trinity? It's verse 7. There, and there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And Ooh. these three are one. That's right. So if you don't get it from Genesis, at least get it from 1 John. And there are three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Wow. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which He has testified of His Son. Again, how does God testify of His Son? He unveils Him. He unveils Him. And he continues to unveil. And he continues to unveil. In creation story, he unveiled. And in, in Moses, he unveiled. In Abraham, he unveiled. He unveiled. He unveiled. He unveiled at the cross. And he's unveiling again at the what? The second coming. The revelation. That word is the unveiling.
Verse 10, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. It's not, it's not even that, it's not bad enough that you say, oh, I just don't believe, or my life, so what, my life doesn't line up, I believe. What John says is, you made God a liar. Because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. So it, now, do you get that? That's just, that's just as strong as, you know, he took your place kind of thing. Saying that you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God is saying God's a liar. And this, verse 11, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Eternal life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. See, we're still playing with that um, oh, insurance card, fire insurance card, heaven card. I hate to say that other term because it was a movie. I was, I thought it was a pretty good movie. But grace card kind of thing where it's like you get a card or you get your card punched. Whoa. Because all those pictures give me this outside God is still on the outside. But see, if you get this, the outside God has come on the inside. Wow. And that's real fellowship. See, if you got a, a, a problem with a mind thought or a, you know something you just can't seem to get, Paul says, well, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. They're constantly calling us to this oneness and intimacy of relationship. Verse 13. Oh, did I say 12? He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. This is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. If anyone sees his brother sinning, a, sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself or herself, and the wicked one does not touch them. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Is that true today? Yes. And we know, verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come, unveiled, He's revealed Himself, and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life, Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. What a letter. So you can see how, how this beginning and this ending, boy, they, he's just screaming. I gotta tell you how, what this means, man. I gotta have you understand what John 114 is all about. So you kind of get this. See, if you really don't get this, then you're really not going to believe that Jesus Christ is living on the inside of you. And every time you've got to come up against sin or temptation or battle, you're going to keep on thinking that, well, God's given me strength to overcome. 
Well, God's given me cold water to overcome. Whoa. No. You're an overcomer because He overcame. And now, He invites you to overcome with Him. It's because of Him that we can. How Paul say it? That we live, that we move, that we breathe in all our being. we, we got to get this. Yeah. This is what Paul was getting down the road to Damascus. Because he says, what do you want to do in and through me, Jesus? And that's our question on the other side of the board. The question we're supposed to ask. The question that Jesus is asking us. What do you want me to do in and through you? Uh, so whatever the question is, he can handle it. The question is, are you going to let him handle it? Are you going to let him be in control? Are you going to let him manifest himself in and through you? Are you going to have fellowship one to another? Are you going to walk in the light as he is in the light? So that we can have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. Jesus, two chapters in this in this letter, not even probably answered all the questions that we have in this room this morning. If we were really to be honest and that, have questions about healing, questions about uh, self worth, questions about work, questions about school, questions about relationships, questions about life. Questions about depression, questions about um, addictions, Lord, any question. Questions about ministry, questions about marriage, all those questions are all, are all answered in, in these two chapters of 1 John. We have got to know this truth and be set free. Consume our hearts and continue to consume our minds. We continue to offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices so that you will continue to cleanse us, mold us, and shape us, and transform us from the inside out. So that we can be vessels of truth, vessels of this unveiling gospel of who you really are. Maybe so. Maybe so. So just give yourself to Jesus. Not on the first date. Not the first night. Not the first year you were a Christian. You give yourself to Him so that He has His way in and through you. So that He fills you with His Spirit. So that He lives and moves and breathes in and through you. We weren't built. We weren't built to be full of stress. We weren't built to toil and sweat. We weren't built for that. Go back to 1 and 2 of Genesis again. We were built to rest in Him. We were built to be the house of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
And Jesus brings us back to that right relationship in and through the cross. Paul says what? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. They're His. In this temple. Glorify Him in all that you say, in all that you do, in all that you are. In all that He'll allow you to be. Love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to, to come as we close. Come and give yourself to Jesus at these altars. Come and receive.